Good evening, everyone at Praise Chapel Revival Oxnard. This is Pastor Johnny Montillo, and I'm so glad that you are joining us tonight for our Wednesday midweek service. It is my hope and my desire that tonight's word bring you to a deeper closeness to Jesus Christ and allow you to have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. As we begin tonight, I just wanted to thank the shepherd of our church, Pastor Mondo Carrillo, and his wife, Sister Veronica Carrillo, for all that they do for the body of Christ. They are beacons of the Holy Spirit, so continue to keep them in prayer as they always have us in their prayers also. I'm excited for tonight's service, so let us open up in a brief word of prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, because you alone are great, mighty, and wonderful. In us and through us, Lord Jesus Christ, you do great and mighty things. But none greater, Lord Jesus Christ, than giving us a spirit that forgives one another, one another when we are offended. For you have forgiven us much, Lord Jesus Christ, and we are to forgive others also. So in tonight's service, I pray that people come with open minds, open spirits, willing to receive your holy word and to bring them to cultivate a spirit of forgiveness. Holy Spirit, we yield tonight's service unto you. Let the word spoken tonight, let the word spoken tonight be not just of us, but be more of you, to have more of you involved in it, Holy Spirit. So we yield tonight's service to you, and we pray in expectation that you are going to do a great and mighty thing through this service tonight. And we ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Tonight I wanted to talk to you and, and, and briefly ask you a question about how's your forgiving going? How is your forgiving of others going? Quite often, the most difficult thing that a Christian can do is to forgive those who have wronged them. It's a, it's a trait that has to be developed. It's a trait that has to be dependent on the Holy Spirit. But all too often, rather than show forgiveness to others, we have an unforgiving spirit that brings us down a path that is of damage, that is of division, and that is of separation. Before I begin tonight, I wanted to talk to you about a writer by the name of Corey Ten Boom. Corey Ten Boom is an accomplished Christian writer known for her various classic writings. One of her most famed books, entitled The Hiding Place, describes her torture and her torment during Nazi Germany. During the Nazi German occupation of Europe, Corey Ten Boom and her family took the risk of hiding Jewish families in their home. When it was discovered that they were hiding Jewish families in their home, they were sent to a concentration camp by the Nazis. During that time in the concentration camp, Corey was tortured daily, Corey was beaten daily, and starved frequently. Even her family who was there experienced the same. She miraculously survived the time there, and she attributed her survival of the Nazi concentration camp to her reliance on Jesus Christ. Shortly after the war was over, she began to travel throughout Europe giving her testimony of Jesus Christ and how he rescued her to the concentration camps. During her post-war years, as she was traveling through Munich in 1947, she was giving her testimony there. And she was giving her testimony and she was giving an evangelical speech about forgiveness. And she noticed while she was giving her testimony and her speech that there was a man in the back who was weeping, who was crying, and she could not take her eyes off him. And when the call came for those to come up and get prayer, the man, weeping, came to the front. And immediately, Corey Ten Boom froze. For she had noticed that this man was one of her captors. This man was one of the Nazi guards who had beaten her and starved her and tortured her for years. And in that moment, she describes how she felt a mix of emotions, a mix of things. She recognized his voice as he asked for prayer, and she immediately began to relive all those terrible atrocities that had happened to her and her family. She began to picture all that she had gone through, and there he was asking for prayer. Her frozen state began to change when the man spoke out loud and said, thank you for the message you just gave. And he told her this, how wonderful it is to know that my sins are at the bottom of the sea. In that moment, Corey embraced him and she felt an overwhelming freedom overcome her. And in that moment, as she embraced him, she forgave all that he had done. Totally miraculous forgiveness. 
totally Holy Spirit-filled forgiveness. That she would have the Christ-like character to forgive this person who had tortured her for years, to forgive this person who had beaten her for years, and to embrace him in forgiveness. What faith, what reliance on Jesus, and what truth and authenticity in her walk with Christ. You see, by the grace of God and the sacrifice of Christ, we have a most miraculous forgiving and freedom from our sins. Our sins develop a debt that by no, by no means can we rectify or, or, or remedy on our own. We can never pay the, the debt we owe to God back. Yet, we are shown compassion and mercy, undeserved mercy and compassion that we don't even deserve through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. There is abundant power and freedom and forgiveness. Yet all too often we harbor inside of us an unforgiving spirit, a spirit that doesn't forgive others. And yet we still have the nerve to raise our hand and worship to the Lord. Here's the fact of the matter. If we have an unforgiving attitude within us, then we have not truly embraced and been grateful, if you will, for the forgiveness that we have been given through Jesus Christ. Here's the truth. We have been forgiven much, and we must forgive much. Our base scripture tonight, which, which uh, culminates everything we're going to be talking about, comes out of Ephesians 4, 31 through 32. And the verse reads, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. Get rid of all those things that deter us. Get rid of all those distractions. Get rid of all those things that divide the body of Christ. But most importantly, as that scripture says, be kind and compassionate to one another and forgive each other just as you have been forgiven by Christ God. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the parable of the unforgiving servant, as noted in Matthew chapter 18. And in this parable, Christ gives us a most blessed teaching on how we have been forgiven and why we should also extend forgiveness to others also. If you will, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18, and we're beginning in verse 21. And the verse reads, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother and sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but seventy-seven times. You see, all too often, we place limits and conditions on our level of forgiveness to others. We, we place a limit or even a, a numerical value at times on our forgiveness to others. Oh, if he or she wrongs me once more, I'm writing them off. Or if he or she offends me once more, one more time, then I'm done with them. And Peter did the same thing. Peter, rather than hear the Lord's response, he adds his own statute of seven times. Lord, should we forgive seven times? He places a numerical condition on the amount of times forgiveness could be necessary. Now, this wasn't uncommon during the time of Jesus because the rabbis and the Pharisees at the time suggested that forgiveness only be displayed three times when sinned against. So the rabbis and the Pharisees of the time decided that three times and that should be it. You should not forgive anymore. So Peter, in this sense, was going above and beyond, but it still wasn't enough. And though Jesus states 77 times and in a different interpretations could actually mean seven times 77, which is more around like 500 times, it's not to be confused that Christ is, is indicating an actual number. But what he's saying that it, it, it's an innumerable times, innumerable amount of times that we should be forgiving, not placing numerical value on the times we should forgive each other, but forgiving always, no matter what. Now think of this and you're forgiving of others? Have you been placing numbers on that amount and, and, and the distance of your forgiveness, much like Peter and the rabbis at the time did? Are you placing statutes on how many times you think you should be forgiven as opposed to embracing exactly what Jesus said in here innumerable times, infinite amount of times? Peter was asking, how wide, how deep should our forgiveness be? And Jesus responds with endless forgiveness. 
Forgiveness that doesn't keep a ledger. Forgiveness that doesn't keep a track record, but just forgives. Like Peter, we often ponder or try to indicate our reason or even count how many times or how much we should forgive somebody who has wronged us. Yet the response that Christ gave Peter should resonate still with us today to stop counting and just start forgiving. Forgiveness is no simple act and it's no simple trait. And at times, forgiveness is so hard that we have to rely on God always to fully forgive. But God has extended his grace and forgiveness in so much abundance to us that we too should return forgiveness to those who cause offense to us. One thing is for sure, that the debt of our own sin is too wide and too deep to be settled or paid by our own means. Jesus, in his wisdom, takes the opportunity directly after Peter's statement to discuss forgiveness, to describe its necessity through the parable of the unforgiving servant. As we go deeper into Matthew chapter 18, verses 23 to 25, Jesus begins a parable and he says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. And since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had had to be sold to repay the debt. You see, each of us owes a debt that is too large to be paid. Each of us, because of our sin, owed a debt that was too deep and too wide to be paid. It was unpayable. And as Jesus opens this most gorgeous parable of forgiveness, he opens it with a statement, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like. Now, don't glaze over this statement because what Jesus is in essence saying is that forgiveness is, Having a spirit of forgiveness is a founding principle in the kingdom of God. If we want to advance the kingdom, we need to begin forgiving one another of our offenses. The king, in the opening of the parable, wanted to settle the accounts he had with his servants. You see, the term he used here in terms of settling the accounts is to audit them, to examine the accounts, to see where they were at, to make sure they were aligned. How would you and I stand today if God did a sin audit or a sin examination of where we are in our walk today? If God came like the king to the servant and said, I want to see where your account is at, where your sin account is at, I venture to say we too would be in a debt too large to be paid by our own means. The servant couldn't pay any of the debt at all, not one cent of it. The debt the man owed in terms of these thousand bags of gold, it's thought to be upwards of $4 billion if computed to our current time. Now that's crazy, isn't it? He owed upwards of $4 billion of what today's time would be. Now in the time of the parable, and even now, this would represent an unpayable, non-reconstitutionable debt, one that could not be paid or settled. It would represent a situation that seemed hopeless and one that could never be remedied by one's own means, a debt too large, too wide, and too deep that you couldn't even handle it on your own. The kings of those times expected the servants to handle the business well and in faith. And when settlement or examination was asked, the king should never be let down. The king entrusted this servant, if you will, with billions, and yet the man squandered what he was entrusted with. It may come as a shock, but the Lord has also entrusted us with being faithful, with being integral, with being honorable, with being Christ-like. Yet we squander that, and our very Christian character is in question. We squander what is truly priceless, our salvation at times when we sin not thinking that there is a debt that has to be paid. We also are expected to be faithful, expected to be integral, and when we are examined to be found righteous, yet we also let our king down at times in our sin and in our actions. And when this occurs, the Lord is within every right to demand an answer and to demand justice. It's crazy to think of it, isn't it? That that sin has created a debt unpayable. Unpayable. 
There's by no means that, that we can remedy our own sin. Just like this man by no means could remedy those billions of dollars. But Christ in his goodness, God in his greatness, makes a way. As we see in Matthew chapter 18, verses 26 through 27. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him and said, Be patient with me. He begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. And let him go. Mercy, forgiveness, and a clean slate is available if only we would cry out. If only we would repent. In the most hopeless of situations, unable to pay any of the debt and facing punishment, the servant does the one thing he can do. He surrenders. He falls to his knees and he begs for more time to pay a debt that can never be paid. Back against the wall and nowhere else to turn, he pleads and he begs sincerely and authentically. You and I have also found ourselves in hopeless situations brought about by our own sinful ways and, and our backs have been against the wall and the only thing that we can do is ask the Lord to forgive us and to give us another chance. That's what the man was asking for. Give me more time. Give me another chance. Give me another shot to pay back a debt that I can't even pay back. I can't even pay back at all. The servant was in danger of losing all he loved because of the debt that he couldn't repay. So he begged. He knelt. He hungered, he humbled himself rather. And we too are in danger of losing everything if we do not plead and beg in repentance for forgiveness that only Jesus Christ the King can bring. The King was moved with compassion, it says, seeing and knowing that the debt could never be paid back by the servant. He does what he has the King, he has a King only he can do which is take pity and cancel the debt in full. To take pity and cancel the debt in full. You see, the sin debt that we have incurred, the debt that, that we have, have uh, made in our sin, only the King, only the King Jesus, only our King Jesus can cancel that debt in full through His compassion, through His pity on us. And see, this is a beautiful picture of the generosity and forgiveness that Christ extended towards us, the sinners. He forgave our unpayable debt. It's canceled just like the servant's debt. And that's something to be joyful about. That's something to be increasingly joyful about. The forgiveness given by the king was no simple act. It was truly a miracle. A cancellation of all debt and freedom from punishment deserved. It was a miracle. And we too have experienced that same miracle of cancellation when it comes to our sin debt and freedom from the punishment that we too deserve brought about only by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It gets me so excited to know that the debt has been canceled. My debt, our debt has been canceled. And only we would come to him sincerely begging for a second chance. We too have experienced the miracle of cancellation of our sin debt. And like I said, freedom from the punishment. But here's where it gets thick. Knowing this, knowing that we have been forgiven, are we extending forgiveness to others? Are we extending that same forgiveness to others who have offended us? I venture to say not too often. And as the parable continues, we'll see the response that we often have towards offenses, and towards those who have wronged us. As we continue on in Matthew chapter 18, verses 29 through 30. It says, But when the servant went out, immediately after he was forgiven, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins, and he grabbed him and began to choke him, and said, Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. What's our response to being forgiven? Is it to forgive others? Are we displaying a spirit of forgiveness? Are we taking that forgiveness that God has given us for granted and not extending it to others when they have offended us? 
Are we being Christ-like in our forgiving of offenses? Or are we rather acting out just like this servant did? Because after experiencing a mercy-filled forgiveness, the man doesn't display the same to others. The servant doesn't display the same to others. In fact, his response is entirely different from what was shown to him by the king. That should resonate within us. Is our response to offense the same response the King Jesus Christ has given us? You see, you would think that after having an unpayable debt forgiven, that this servant would be on cloud nine, that he'd be joyful, skipping around and feeling great. And that feeling might have been there for a moment, but it was only a flash. And then it was gone. And he forgot mercy and forgiveness and all that he was shown when it came to somebody who owed him. We are like this at times too. We are on cloud nine when we finally get that encounter with the Holy Spirit. When we finally get that salvation moment where we know that all our sins, our unpayable debt is forgiven. We are joyful and exuberant and thankful. And yet, immediately after at times, we're unforgiving. When it comes to somebody who comes to us pleading for forgiveness. The debt that the fellow owed the servant was realistic. It was a far cry from what the servant owed the king. It was nowhere near near the billions that he owed. In current time, it might have been around $10,000. A far cry from the billions that the servant owed the king. It was a debt that was truly forgivable. Yet none of this mattered to the servant. It was as though he undervalued the compassion and pity he was shown just moments ago. So much that he forgot He forgot. He forgot experiencing impossible forgiveness. Because if he remembered it, he would have extended it back to the man. Notice this. It says that he sought someone who owed him. He went out of his way to find him. He was violent. He was angry. He was demanding. And when the man knelt and begged, just like the servant did before the king, there wasn't mercy, but there was a refusal And and he acted out erratic and totally outside of the way that he was treated by the king. He should be passing on the forgiveness he had been given. And we too should take heed to this also. You see, something about unforgiveness that occurs is it clouds us. It clouds the way we think. It clouds the way we react. And it, it, it clouds our logic at times. Something to note here is that the servant had the fellow thrown in prison until he could pay the debt. Now think about how crazy that is. How could this man even begin to pay the servant back if he was in jail? How could he create an earning if he was in jail? So unforgiven was he, unforgiving rather was he, that it clouded all that logic meant. And that's what unforgiveness does to us. It clouds us. It clouds the way we think. It deters our logic and it makes us act out erratic. Like I said, so great was this man's unforgiveness, the servant's unforgiveness, that he didn't even realize that placing the man in jail would never give the man a chance to getting that payback to him. It was a response that was aimed to hurt the man and fool. Not just unforgiving attitude, but a hurtful attitude. The debt owed to him was nowhere near what he had owed the king, and yet he acted out in ferociousness. This is fool unforgiveness displayed in action. And quite frankly, it's the response that we often have when we have been wronged also. We seek to hurt. We act violently at times. We, we act angry, demanding, and refuse to forgive, no matter how much those who have wronged us plead and sincerely ask for mercy and forgiveness. That's the attitude that we have at times. That if someone would come to us in authenticity saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and I'm just begging you for forgiveness, that we would say, no, I don't want to hear it. Failing to realize the amount that we have been forgiven by Jesus. Now, we don't place people in prison, but we do isolate them from us. We, we punish them cruelly and, and, and forget the forgiveness that has been shown to us by God. We, we can, can't write off the ones who hurt us. We can't write them off. But we need to show forgiveness to understand and to bear with one another. But all too often, we're quick to write a person off when they've wronged us. We're quick to shun them and, and, to, and to tell them to leave us alone and, and don't come near us rather than to extend mercy. But here's what Colossians 3.13 says. It says, bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord 
forgave you. Pretty clear cut. Bear with, bear with one another. Because God bared with us. He was patient with us. If we have a grievance or, or someone has offended you and forgive just as the Lord forgave you. That's a hard thing to do. And I understand what you're saying right now. That's most difficult. Do you know what this person or that person did to me? And I'm telling you, if you knew Jesus, if your relationship with Jesus is solidified, you'll understand the power of forgiving, even when it's hard. Imagine this. If in your last sin, God decided to refuse you, to be violent and angry with you, to throw you aside. And to not hear your plead, no matter how much you beg, that'd be an awful thing now, wouldn't it? The way the servant acted in response to how he was forgiven might seem crazy. But it's quite the norm sometimes when people have offended us that this is how we react. Nowhere near a Christ-like response, but more fleshly and more about us than about advancing the kingdom. As we continue on in Matthew chapter 18, verse 31 through 35, we're going to see what the consequence of an unforgiving person is. It says, when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged when they saw that, that this man, had, uh, this servant had, uh, had uh, punished this man. They were outraged and, and went and told their master everything that had happened. And then the master called the servant in and he said this, you wicked servant, he said, I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And in anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Now that's shocking because we will be held accountable for our unforgiveness. We will be held accountable for our unforgiveness to an offense. As Jesus capped off the parable, he said to forgive your brother or sister from your heart, from the deepest of things to truly forgive not just say you forgive but to mean it we think our unforgiving ways are are to be hidden or to be concealed but the truth is truth be told if there's one thing that's noticeable in a person it's our unforgiveness towards one another if there's one thing that's noticeable within people it's the grudges that they hold they're not hidden they're out there we're not fooling anybody when we're unforgiving when we have that unforgiving spirit it's out there it's on display the servants peers Notice his actions first. The other servants noticed the servants' actions first. They noticed and they were outraged. You see, the attitude of unforgiveness is always on full display. It's not hidden. Like I said, it's not concealed. It's, it's there. It's on the surface. Others seen his conduct and noticed when he himself couldn't see it. See, we might be blind to our unforgiveness at times. We may not notice it at times. But truth be told, it's on full display. If anything, it's on the surface, like I said. And it's an awful thing to be handed over to your own unforgiveness. To know that unforgiveness that we divvy out to others. Can you imagine if God had that same attitude towards us? That, that only certain offenses will be forgiven. That only certain things, only certain things are to be overlooked. Only certain, certain things are to be canceled, like, like we think. Imagine if God thought like we thought, how we would all probably end up in the fires of hell. The king states that the servant forgiven should have responded the same. He should have responded exactly as he was treated. You see, we are forgiven, not just for salvation, but also to cultivate forgiveness to others. The sacrifice of, of Jesus on the cross was to also show us what it means to sacrifice and forgive others no matter how much they have hurt us. We often overlook that at times. All too often we hold back forgiveness and this creates another debt of unforgiveness that must be, must be paid. See, we have one sin debt canceled only to create another debt of unforgiveness that needs to be answered. And the king calls a servant wicked because of his unforgiveness towards another. Is that what we aim to be called? Are we seeking righteousness or, or, or do we want to be called wicked because of our unforgiveness? Even when it's difficult to forgive, we have to begin the process of forgiving. 
It's going to take some reliance on the Holy Spirit, full reliance, if you will. It's going to take going in your word and prayer. It's going to take deep rooted roots into the foundation of Jesus Christ. But we have to begin the process of forgiving one another, even when it's difficult. Quite frankly, the most terrifying of statements comes at the end of the parable when Christ states that if we are unforgiving towards others, we will be treated exactly like the wicked servant. I find that shocking. And truly in times that, that, that I have had that, that attitude of unforgiveness, it's scriptures like this that bring me back in alignment. It's scriptures like this that should bring us back into alignment. Jesus said this at the end of the scriptures in, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 35. He said this, this is how your heavenly father will treat each of you unless, unless you forgive your brother or sister from the heart. I'll tell you what, I don't want to be tortured. I don't want to be separated. I don't want to be required to pay in full something that I have no chance of clearing, a debt that I have no chance of clearing, a debt of no relief because of my unforgiveness. And you shouldn't either. If you are having difficulty forgiving, you need to seek the Lord more deeply. You need to uh, uh, resonate on scriptures exactly like this. Unless you forgive, unless you forgive, You'll be treated exactly like that unforgiving servant. And that's truly a place we don't want to be. I'm not saying forgiveness is easy. I'm not blind to that. All I'm saying is all things are possible if we rely and are rooted in Jesus Christ. Turn your Bibles, if you will, to Proverbs 17, verse 9. It says, whoever would foster love covers over an offense. But whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. And we need to ask ourselves a critical question. Do we want to be divided because of our unforgiveness? Can you imagine if, 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 if God desired to be away from us, to be divided from us? But he loved us so much. He loved us so much that he gave his own son to mend the relationship through forgiveness. And it's the same with us. God doesn't want us at each other's throats. He doesn't want us at odds with each other. But he wants relationships between the body of Christ, between members of the body of Christ, and to, to show those who are outside of, of, of the belief right now, to draw them into the belief through forgiving them, through forgiveness. Because that's what true love is. As the proverb we just read, it says, love covers over an offense. Love cancels that offense. The more we love and forgive, the more that, that offense is canceled. And it never repeats the matter. It never repeats the matter. Because there is power in forgiveness. There is miracle power in forgiveness. There is a display of love in forgiveness. Love still for the person who have wronged you. Love that mends the broken relationship. Love that loves to display the forgiving compassion of Jesus Christ. Our forgiveness of others can't be half ways. It has to be full. Yet all too often we say this, this cursed phrase, forgive but don't forget. I hate that phrase. I hate that phrase. Because imagine if, if that was God's attitude towards us. That God would forgive us, but not to forget. That God would forgive us our, our, and clear our debt, but, but not forget. Yet God says in his word, as far as from the east is to the west, that our sins is forgotten. And that's our response also. We shouldn't have the attitude, oh, forgive, but don't forget. It doesn't even make sense. D.L. Moody once said this, Forgiveness is not the type which says, I will forgive, but not forget. It is not to bury the hatchet, yet leave the handle sticking out of the ground so you can grasp it any moment you want. And what that, that, that quote is saying is, is there is no halfway forgiveness. It has to be full. Because perhaps the greatest hindrance to our forgiveness lies with our constant bringing the matter back up. To our constant bringing it up. You know what? Here's the truth. If you truly forgive a person, you won't bring the past things up. All the time. You won't use them as a crutch in an argument. You won't use them in this way. You won't bring the matter up. 
We're living the hurt. We're playing the offense. And I'm not saying this is an easy matter. I'm not saying this is an easy trait to have. Getting past this is most difficult, yet if we stay the course, we will overcome the scheme of remembrance. And I'm gonna say that again, the scheme of remembrance. The enemy would love for you to remember all the hurts and the pains, rather than to press on forward to the joy, the freedom, and the mending of a relationship. Forgiveness by no means is easy. It takes a rooted Christian character one would say to forgive in its own, like I said, is miraculous. In fact, true forgiveness takes reliance and dependence on the Holy Spirit and remembrance also of the forgiveness that we have also received. I challenge you, or not even challenge, I just ask you tonight, forgive and be free. Forgive and give God glory. And forgive, most importantly, because you have been forgiven also. As I mentioned earlier on, Corey Ten Boom experienced those atrocities and those, those beatings and the being tortured in a Nazi concentration camp. And she could have responded with unforgiveness. And most of us would say she'd be in the right, but she didn't respond like most of us would. She responded in love. She responded in forgiveness. And tonight, I'd like to end our service with a quote from her. And Corey Ten Boom wrote this. She said, forgiveness is the key that unlocks the door of resentment and the handcuffs of hatred. It is the power that breaks the chain of bitterness and the shackles of selfishness. How true is that? How amazing is that? We have a key, a key that can unlock those feelings we hold of resentment and selfishness. We have a key, if you will, that unlocks freedom from reliving those pains and those hurts. And it's in forgiving one another. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for this most, most convicting and, and most encouraging at the same time. I know it sounds crazy, but I feel inspired, Lord, and I pray that others do too, to begin the process of forgiving those who have hurt us. To overlook an offense, Lord Jesus Christ, just like you have canceled out ours, Lord. Let us not be an unforgiving servant, but let us be a servant dependent on you with a forgiving spirit. Let us not halfway forgive one another either, but let us be all in because you were so all in and forgiving us and mending our relationship to your Father that you gave your very life. And all that you ask of us, Lord Jesus Christ, is to forgive others also. You're not even asking us to lay down our life all the time like you did or to lay down your very life. But you are asking us just to respond in the way you responded to our pleas and to our sincereness. And we know, Lord Jesus Christ, forgiving is a hard thing because a lot of us have deep hurts, hurts that are extreme, hurts that are, are deep. And I pray for those tonight, Lord Jesus Christ, for those who haven't hurt so deep that would say in their, in, 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 their, in their mind right now, I can't forgive, that you would begin, Holy Spirit, to already touch them and begin to put in a process that cultivated, cultivated attitude of forgiveness. We're not, we're not saying that, that forgiving is easy, Lord. Because it wasn't easy for you to be on that cross. But what we are saying, Lord Jesus Christ, and I declare this tonight, is that we're going to try. We're going to be all in. And we're going to give it our all to be a forgiving servant. Realizing that we should forgive because you have forgiven us. We thank you for the word. We thank you for your presence. And we thank you for your love. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. In tonight's altar moment, I, I just pray tonight that if you are battling an unforgiving spirit, battling forgiving someone who has hurt you, someone who has offended you, 
I pray tonight that you experience freedom from those things. True freedom. That you begin to ask the Lord to help you with forgiving. To help you. To help you with this. It's not always going to be easy to forgive. But I'll tell you what, when we remember what Christ has did for us on the cross, and when we take it to heart and not for granted, we truly begin to realize that because He forgave us, we should forgive others. Let us pray. Father, it's me. Please hear me, my King. I know I am unholy, so unworthy and unclean, but I yearn to know you, my soul thirst for you, and my temple is broken, it's broken down. Take me and make me know, yeah. Oh, Father, Father, hear me, hear me. God, God rules. I'm not asking for blessings, not your hand, Lord, but to know your heart. So show me the way without your Father. Oh, I'm patiently waiting oh, for you, Lord. To take me and make me know. Hallelujah. Take me, Lord, yeah. Hallelujah. Take me, Lord. Hallelujah. Make me your. Corey Williams, everybody. Father, it's me Humbly On my knees I know I am unworthy Unholy And unclean But I long to know you My soul thirsts for you. you. My temple is broken down. Oh, take me and make me new. Oh, Father, Father hear me. God rules. I'm not asking for blessings anymore. Not your hand, Lord. But to know your heart, show me, show me the 